for each one of us as we enter into this place of worship to be saying to God, God, fill me up. Fill me up with your presence. Give me Jesus. Let me know his power. Let me feel his grace once again. So welcome to worship each and every one of you today. A very special welcome to any guests that we have with us this morning. We're so glad that you are here. And we certainly do uh, trust that all of us will be blessed by being in God's house today. We're here to worship. And so I'd like to read just a few verses from Psalm 145, God's call to worship, his invitation for us today. David says, I will extol you, my God and King. I'm going to bless your name forever and ever. Every day I will bless you and praise your name. Great is the Lord. And greatly to be praised, his greatness is unsearchable. So this is the God whom we gather before this morning. This is the God whom we worship and praise today. This great and awesome God, the one true God. And this is the God who wants to greet his people today. So would you please stand to receive his greeting? Congregation God greets us this morning with these words. Grace mercy and peace be to you from God our Father, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, in the power and fellowship of the Holy Spirit and all God's people said, amen. amen.
Would you pray with me? God, it is with great joy that we gather here today to sing our praises to you, the one true God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and to know that we do so not because of who we are, not because of what we have done, but because of what you have done for us in Jesus, and ultimately because of who you are, a God of love and a God of grace, a God of mercy and a God of faithfulness. So God, we come before you this morning truly to sing our praises and to offer to you the worship in our hearts, the worship of our very lives. Father, bless this time here that we have together. Speak to us, we pray, by your spirit. Move in our hearts. God, may we hear clearly what you want us to hear today and go from this place rejoicing in your goodness. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. You may be seated. Well, I'd like to invite you to take out your gray Psalter hymnal and turn in the back of them with me to page 976. Page 976 in the back of the gray Psalter, and there we are going to find a preparatory exhortation for the Lord's Supper. It is a responsive reading, so we'd like to go through this together. As we prepare to celebrate Holy Communion, let's remember that Scripture calls us to examine ourselves before God. We're taught that eating and drinking unworthily brings judgment upon ourselves. Let us therefore ask God for the proper spirit in which to celebrate the sacrament. Almighty God, before whom can be neither secret thought nor hidden deed, grant us your spirit that we may know our hearts, our lives, and our inmost thoughts as you know them. Grant us your grace that we may repent sincerely of all sin, find peace with you through our Lord Jesus Christ, and grow in assurance of salvation in him. May the celebration of our Savior's infinite love and his redeeming death bring joy to us and glory to you. We thank you, Heavenly Father, for the atoning power of our Savior's death and for our share in his victory over sin. Open our hearts as we prepare for this celebration, that it may strengthen us in our faith, establish us in our hope, and confirm us in our love. In his name, amen. Brothers and sisters, let us first examine our faith. We all confess the truth of God as taught by Scripture and summarized in the creeds of the church. By this faith, we take to ourselves Christ and all his benefits, so that for us to live is Christ. Lord God, author and finisher of all true believing, confirm our faith as we prepare for the Holy Sacrament. Let us further examine our hope. All Christian hope rests upon the finished work of Christ as Savior. The Holy Gospel teaches that all our righteousness is in him alone. God's children rely wholly upon the merits of Christ, find in him their strength and victory, and confidently expect his return in glory. They look forward to celebrating this Holy Supper anew with him in the kingdom. They will surely be received by God at his table. Most merciful Father, fill us with all joy and peace in believing, so that by the power of the Holy Spirit, we may abound in hope. Let us also examine our love, both for God and our neighbors. Remember the great and first commandment to love the Lord our God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength. Let us consciously determine to live a life of loving service to him through Christ our Lord. Let us also search ourselves to determine whether we love our neighbors as Christ commands. Do we unselfishly live for the welfare of others? Do our lives reflect the godly virtues of obedience, fidelity, integrity, justice, humility, and contentment? Do we seek reconciliation with our neighbors in all cases of offense? Dear Father, daily increase in us the greatest gift of all, our Christian love. If these marks of spiritual life are not evident in us, we may not presume to approach his table. Those, therefore, who live in self-righteousness, 
who hope in works or virtues of their own, and who do not show love to God and neighbor, have no true place at the Lord's Supper. Yet we should not be deterred by any sin lingering within against our will. As we find faith, hope, and love within us, we ought gladly to obey our Lord's command and come with full expectation to God's open house of mercy. Gracious God, we love and adore you in Christ our Lord. We thank you for reconciling us to yourself in him. We rejoice in being received as your children. Prepare us by your Holy Spirit for the sacrament. Help us to come in the assurance that by it we shall be spiritually revived and strengthened in faith, hope, and love. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. And so even as we're convicted of our sin, we are reminded of our assurance in Christ's death and resurrection and invited to build our lives on him and on his holiness. Would you rise and sing?
have a few announcements to share with you this morning. One of them is to explain the orange colored slide that's been showing the last couple weeks um, about gather and grow an invitation to learn the Shema. Um, love the Lord your God with all your heart, your soul, and your strength. Some of you, we know this in English, some of you have learned it in Hebrew um, already. What I'm inviting you to is an opportunity to learn it, well, to sing it in Hebrew, um, and also to study it and, and some of what it means in a little, on a deeper level. Um, so uh, you, there are a couple of rules. One is you have to be willing to learn. The other is that you have to be willing to poke fun at yourself because it's hard to sing in another language, um, but it is so worthwhile to hold the words of scripture in us um, so deeply that they're memorized. So um, that's kind of what this is about. Everyone is welcome during the Sunday school hour, uh, 11 o'clock next week and for weeks following. So thanks. Thanks, Noah. That goes on for five weeks, right? Probably. All right. Depends how we sing, right? How good we get at that. Yeah. <laughs> Well, another uh, announcement uh, as well before we go to prayer together, and that is a very special welcome to some uh, returning members here to Grafscop. That is Chuck and Kathy Busker. I'm looking around. Just raise your hand a moment for me. There they are in the back. So we want to welcome them. And it is great that you are, are coming back here. We're so glad for that. We thank God for that. And also just a few things to keep in our mind uh, for prayer. Some of these uh, many of us are familiar with, but just to make sure that, that we all know, to pray for the Sanchez family, the loss of uh, Dina's brother, Joe. And then also, uh, if we would be keeping uh, Larry and Kathy uh, Skolton in prayer too. Larry had his shoulder surgery, and it actually went better than what the doctors anticipated. So we're very grateful for that. Uh, even his recovery time will be lessened. Uh, by a few weeks, and uh, that was very good news uh, for Larry. Then also a quick update on Kathy's brother, Mark. He had that CT scan, and it did reveal that there is some cancer that has returned, and so he's going to be starting uh, chemo treatments this coming week. So keep Mark in your thoughts and prayers, too. Then also some of you uh, may already know this, but again, just to make sure all of us do, uh, some longtime members here, haven't been here for a few years now, but some longtime members, Ron and Von Ginzink. Uh, Ron had uh, gone into the hospital this past week with pneumonia, and uh, his situation very quickly deteriorated, and just yesterday uh, he did pass away. And so we want to be in prayer for Von and the family. We know that uh, Ron and Vaughn have very good friends here at, at Grafskop. Uh, we know that uh, Heather uh, Alfrank, that's her uncle. And uh, so just pray uh, for that family. Uh, from what I understand, the service is being prepared uh, for tomorrow at Providence. I don't have a time for you on that yet, but uh, if you want to know, look online or, or, or in the uh, Sentinel perhaps would have uh, the obituary information. So check that, but certainly uh, be in prayer. So let's go to God in the time of prayer together. Lord God, it is so good to be able to come before you in worship and so good to be able to come before you in prayer. And to know that as we do, as we gather here for worship, that we gather before the one true God of this universe, the creator of the heavens and the earth, our Father, our Son, and our Holy Spirit, our God, God, it is so good to come into your presence today. So good to know that you are truly the only one who is worthy of our worship. And we know as human beings that we are made to worship. It is part of our DNA. And that if we don't worship you, we will worship something else, something that is not worthy. But God, you are worthy. And we are so glad that in your grace you have revealed yourself to us, that we know you, not just as this great and awesome God, but we know you as our creator. We know you as our redeemer. We know you as our sustainer. And God, because of this, we worship you with all that we are. 
Father, we thank you that we can come before you this morning, even as we anticipate next Sunday gathering around the table and celebrating the wondrous salvation that you have given to us in Jesus, your Son, our Savior. And we can think about, again, we can reflect upon our relationship with you. We can reflect upon our hope and our love and and the peace that you have given to us in our hearts. And we can make sure as we come next week that we truly are right with you. Father, we pray that throughout this week, each one of us would have the opportunity to, to reflect on those things. And to be reinforced again in our spirit, even by your spirit moving within us, that we truly are your children, that we are your sons, that we are your daughters, that we know this marvelous gift of salvation, that we know what it is to be forgiven, and we know what it is to look forward with absolute certainty to eternal life with you, even into the new heavens and the new earth. Father, we are humbled by what you have done for us. And we certainly give you thanks. Father, we thank you for the gift of your church. We thank you for how you continue to build it, your church. And certainly as true as that is around the world, even in places where believers are persecuted for their faith, that Father, it is equally true right here at Grafscott that you continue to build it, your church. We are so thankful for Chuck and Kathy, and we're so thankful for for other new faces and other familiar faces that come week after week, and those who will join the ministry here. And Father, we pray that together more and more you continue to make us and mold us as a community of believers into a people who is ready to do your will, ready to engage you, ready to engage the gospel, ready to engage our community as well, and to be that salt and that light that you call us to be. Father, that's who we want to be. And we pray that more and more as a, as a community of faith here, as a body of believers, that more and more you would be building us in that way. Father, as a community, as brothers and sisters in Christ, it is a privilege to pray for each other. Father, we we rejoice when, uh, when any one of us rejoices, and we weep when any one of us weeps. Father, today, in a very particular way, we pray for those who have recently lost loved ones. We think of the Sanchez family and the loss of Dina's brother, Joe. We think of the Gensing family and and the loss of Ron. And Father, we know that these families are hurting, that many close friends are hurting today, and we hurt with them, and we pray for them, and we pray that you would grant your peace and your comfort into their lives today. And Father, as over the next little bit of time, whether it's tomorrow or a few days off, as these families go through visitations and funerals and all of these things and say their final earthly goodbyes. Father, we pray that you would lift their eyes toward heaven, that once again we would remember the cross and the empty tomb, that we would remember your love and remember your grace and your great promises to us, and that we would know the hope of Jesus. Father, we pray for Larry today. We're so thankful for a successful shoulder surgery that he could have. So thankful to hear that it went even better than what the doctors were anticipating, that his time of recovery is lessened by a significant amount of weeks. But we do pray for that healing to take place and for a measure of patience for Larry to allow that healing to happen. Father, we pray too for Kathy's brother Mark. As a scan has showed that his cancer is back and starting chemo again this week, and we pray for that those treatments to be effective for him. Father, we continue to pray today too for Reverend Russ Van Antwerpen and this brain bleed that he has recently experienced and we pray, Lord, that you would continue to be with him. We know that he's still with us. We know that he's receiving some treatments and we still know that his situation is very tenuous and we pray for that. Father, for be your will that you would bring healing into his body. Now continue to be with him and support the family too as they go through this time together. 
Be with others of our congregation that are dealing with struggles or challenges in their lives, whether they be physical or perhaps related to their job or maybe family issues or things at school. Father, we pray for each one of these. Father, remind us again to look to you and to know that that your grace is sufficient, that you will give to us exactly what we stand in need of, that you are always there, that you never fail us. Father, too, we pray for those of our congregation in, in nursing homes and those who are shut in, those who cannot get here on a regular basis. We pray for them today. We thank you for each one of them. Father, we pray that you would encourage their spirits today, too. Father, as we think outside of these walls, we think of our area farmers, and we recognize that the harvest season is very quickly approaching. Father, we thank you for the sunshine. We thank you for the rain. Father, we thank you for your faithfulness. And although it was a difficult season, we thank you already for the harvest that will come in. And we know this is a gift from you. Be with our farmers, keep them safe, and and care for them. And Father, for our nation, as so many things uh, seem to be going on at one time as they impact our nation, as our president continues to seek to give leadership, Father, we pray for him as we are called to do in Scripture, to pray for all of those in authority over us. We pray for the situations that he deals with, many of which we cannot even begin to to imagine, and the pressures that he experiences. And as true as that is for our nation's president, it is equally true for, uh, for local leaders and state leaders as well. And we think of them and pray for them. We think of our emergency response people. We thank you for them and pray for them. And we think of uh, those men and women in in our armed services too. We thank you for their service. And we pray that you continue to keep them and protect them. Father, for all of these many things, we pray. And we pray in faith, knowing that you hear. Father, knowing that you will answer and thanking you already for the answers that you will give. Lord, bless us as we continue in our service today. Keep our hearts firmly focused on you. And Father, again, as we go from this place, may we be ready to truly live for you, to live as your people. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We have the opportunity to give of our gifts. And this morning, the offering is for World Renew, designated very specifically Uh, for Hurricane Dorian Relief. And so obviously this is something we've heard a lot about recently. This is an opportunity for us to to do our part uh, in that, in those relief efforts. So that's what the offering is for today. Joy above all 
Well, this morning we are going to continue uh, thinking about this uh, grand scriptural topic of uh, hope. And uh, very specifically, we're going to be looking at Psalm 27 this morning. So I'd like to invite you to turn there in your Bibles with me. You'll find that on page 543 of your Pew Bibles. Psalm 27. And here David writes, as carried along by the Holy Spirit, The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? When evildoers assail me to eat up my flesh, my adversaries and foes, it is they who stumble and fall. Though an army encamp against me, my heart shall not fear. Though war arise against me, yet I will be confident. One thing have I asked of the Lord, that will I seek after, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to gaze upon the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple. For he will hide me in his shelter in the day of trouble. He will conceal me under the cover of his tent. He will lift me high upon a rock. And now my head shall be lifted up above my enemies all around me. And I will offer in his tent sacrifices and shouts of joy. I will sing and make melody to the Lord. Hear, O Lord, when I cry aloud. Be gracious to me and answer me. You have said, seek my face. My heart says to you, your face, Lord, do I seek. Hide not your face from me. Turn not your servant away in anger, O you who have been my help. Cast me not off, forsake me not, O God of my salvation. For my father and my mother have forsaken me, but the Lord will take me in. Teach me your way, O Lord, and lead me on a level path because of my enemies. Give me not up to the will of my adversaries, for false witnesses have risen against me, and they breathe out violence. I believe that I shall look upon the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Wait for the Lord. Be strong and let your heart take courage. Wait for the Lord. So as far as we'd like to read this morning in God's word, and may he bless his word to us today. Well, congregation, who here likes to wait? Anybody? Anybody? Anybody like to wait? No one? No one likes stopping at red lights. No one likes getting stuck in traffic jams. No one likes sitting in that doctor's office and paging through magazine after magazine. Really? No one? Well, that really doesn't surprise me, obviously. In fact, I would have been surprised if someone raised their hand and said, I do, I do, I really like to wait. In fact, if that happened, I don't think I would even believe that person because no one really likes to wait. Waiting just kind of drives us crazy. I had the opportunity to play a round of golf just a couple of weeks ago uh, with, with a friend of mine. We had some coupons, so we had to use them, right? We had some coupons uh, for the Lynx in Allegan. So we were excited to play. It had been a few weeks since either of us played. He lives in Kalamazoo. I'm here now. So it's kind of the halfway point. And it's getting toward the end of the season. So we wanted to get out. Well, apparently we were not the only ones with that idea. That course was absolutely packed. It just had group after group after group. Most of them were foursomes. We were a twosome stuck in the middle of all this. It took almost three hours for us to play the front nine. And the back nine didn't get any better. It got even slower. In fact, we couldn't even finish. We had to walk off the course. We had things to do. We had places to go. We couldn't do that. To make matters worse, as if that wasn't bad enough, on my way back home, I stopped at Wendy's. 
I hadn't eaten very much all day, so I'm going through the drive-thru, and the drive-thru was ridiculously slow, and it wasn't busy. There was one car ahead of me. That was it. It just kind of drove me crazy. Well, no one really likes to wait, right? We like things now. We're fast food, fast lane, fast paced people. We like to do our instant messaging while we're eating our instant oatmeal, right? We really don't like to wait. But even so, as David tells us here, waiting for the Lord is an essential posture of faith, and it's one that will fill us with hope, even when, or perhaps especially when, things seem to be just spinning out of control. David knew that feeling. I mean, the sense that very, very clearly we get from Psalm 27 is that David's world was kind of crashing in on him. I mean, as he says himself here, evildoers were assailing him, foes were attacking him, an army was besieging him, enemies were surrounding him, false witnesses were rising up against him. Now, granted, we don't know exactly the situation that David was referencing in this psalm, but it seems very clear that from David's perspectives, things were spinning out of control. And yet it becomes very clear in this psalm that fear is not the theme. Confidence is. Confidence in God. Right? David knew that God would, would rescue him. He didn't know how and he didn't know when, but he knew that God would deliver him. Right? Even as David says in the concluding, the, the climactic verses of this psalm, he says, I believe, the NIV says, I am still confident of this that I should look upon the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Wait for the Lord. Be strong and let your heart take courage and wait for the Lord. So even though he was in the midst of very troubling circumstances, David chose to wait for the Lord. And it filled him with an overflowing confidence and gave to him a great hope. And this is a hope very clearly that is grounded in God himself. And as David brings out in the body of this psalm, this is a God who is firm. This is a God who is faithful. This is a God who is forever. And the good news is today that as God's people in Jesus, by grace through faith in Jesus, David's God is our God. And so just as God was firm and faithful and forever to David, he is exactly the same for his people today, for you and for me. So that's what we want to think about today. So first of all, let's make sure that we recognize, let's make sure that we acknowledge that God is firm. That is to say, even as David puts it in verse 1, God is the stronghold of our lives. Now, what's a stronghold exactly, and what does a stronghold do? I think most of us would recognize that typically a stronghold, we would understand, to be a place of refuge. So a stronghold is a place that keeps us safe, right? It's a firm place. It's a solid place. It's a place where we are secure. Now, I don't know about you, but every time I hear the word stronghold, which isn't a lot, it's not a word we hear in our everyday English language, but when I hear that word, I immediately think of a castle. That's where my, my mind goes. Now, way back a number of years ago, after I graduated from, from college, I had the opportunity a few months later to go over to Europe. Most of my time, I spent about a month there, most of my time was in the Netherlands, but we had the opportunity to country hop a little bit and so one day we went to Belgium, and I had the opportunity to go to a real-life castle. It wasn't this one, I have to admit. This is not my picture. I just pulled this one off the internet. It is in Belgium, though, but I don't know if I went to this one. So we went to a castle, and I, like you, I've seen castles on TV. I know I have this image of a castle on my head, but being in a castle is a whole different experience. And you can really begin to sense why people feel safe and secure in castles. Because really, here's a, here's a, a building, a facility. It's, it's very often perched on, a, on an elevated place, right? So they can see all over. It very often has a moat around it like this one does. It's filled with defensive capabilities. And on top of all of that, it's built out of rock, Right? I mean, how much better can it be? 
people in a way, that's exactly the picture that David is painting for us here when he says that God is the stronghold of our lives. But even better than the most secure castle, God is the one sure place that David can go to be safe. Right? In his words, in verse 5, he says, For God will hide me in his shelter, in his castle, in the day of trouble. He will conceal me under the cover of his tent. He will lift me high upon a rock. Right, this is David's God, and by grace through faith in Jesus, this is our God as well. He's our stronghold. He's our light and our salvation. Jesus himself told us, he said to his followers, John chapter 10, verse 29, he says, My Father who has given them, he's talking to his followers, all of those who are his, my Father who has given them to me is greater than all, and no one is able to snatch them out of my Father's hand. No one. God is firm. But you know, not only is our God firm, he is also faithful. That is to say, he is steadfast. We can absolutely depend on him. And David gets at this beginning in verse 9 when he cries out to God and he says, Hide not your face from me. Turn not your servant away in anger. O you who have been my help. David recognizes. And he reflects upon the fact that God has helped him in the past. And boy, has he ever and just think back for just a little bit on David's life, what's shared with us in Scripture, right? Think of how God has helped David in the past, right? Even going all the way back to when he was just a little shepherd boy and he's fighting off the lions. Or when he was just a little bit older and he's standing before the giant Goliath with just a sling and a stone. Or when he's fending off the murderous attempts of Saul when he's establishing his kingship in Israel. Oh, it's so very, very clear. David had most certainly experienced God's help in the past, and because of that, he knows that God is going to help him in the future. And he knows, even as he voices it himself in verse 10, the Lord will take me in. Everybody else might forsake him. He says, even my mother and my father might forsake me. But the Lord, he will never forsake me. In fact, God is relentlessly faithful. He will never falter and he will never fail. This is the God whom David knew. And again, by grace through faith in Jesus, this God is our God. A God who will never forsake us. In fact, God himself told us that, right? He told us that to his people. Malachi, verses 13, excuse me, Hebrews 13, verses 5 and 6. God has said, I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. So look at this next phrase. So we can confidently say, the Lord is my helper. I will not fear. What can man do to me? Or, or what about what Paul says in those very familiar, those wonderful words of Romans chapter 8, right? If God is for us, and the implication here is, yes, he is. If God is for us, and he is, who can be against us? Right? Who can be against us? Who's going to separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble or hardship or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? Paul says, no. In all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced, he says, that neither death nor life nor angels nor rulers, neither things in the present nor things to come, nor any powers, not height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will ever be able to separate us from the love of God that's in Christ Jesus our Lord. Right, this is our God. This is our God who is relentlessly faithful to those who are his, a God who will never forsake us. He's helped us in the past. Right, each one of us. 
We can give testimony to that in our own lives. He's helped us in the past. And he will help us in the future. Because he's faithful. So our God is firm. And our God is faithful, even relentlessly so. And finally... God is forever. He is forever. That is to say, he is firm and he is faithful. This is who he is. And this is whom he will always be. Because he never changes. Just think about that for a moment. I mean, we live in the midst of a world that changes almost daily. Right? We flip on the news one day, it's completely different the next. We live in this world that changes almost daily, even in the midst of our personal lives that can change literally like that. One phone call, one doctor visit, one decision. But God never changes, ever. Right, listen to what he himself said. He, he said this about himself. Malachi 3 verse 6. I, the Lord, do not change. James picks up on that. In the New Testament, he echoes that in chapter 1 verse 17. He says, every good and every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shadow due to change. God is firm, and God is faithful. This is who he is, and who he will always be. He doesn't change. So no matter what we face from day to day, no matter how dramatically things seem to be spinning out of control, there's one thing that's always constant, always the same. And that's our God. And because of that, we can say right along with David, I believe, I believe that I should look upon the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Wait for the Lord. Be strong and take heart and wait for the Lord. You know, when I first arrived here at Grafscop a number of months ago now, one of the very first staff meetings that we had, in fact, I think it was maybe even the first staff meeting that we had together. For devotions, this is, this is the passage I shared with the team. Psalm 27, and very specifically, these last couple of verses. And I shared with them, and I'll share it with all of you, that these couple of verses had really been my theme verse for the past couple of years, leading up to our acceptance of the call here at Grafscott. Because I've shared this with you before, particularly those who've journeyed on that search committee and, and some who were here last December at the congregational meeting, that for a couple of years we had felt that God was, was preparing us for something, that we felt that he was getting us ready to, for a different service, maybe going to a new church. And as you can imagine, that was, a, that was a difficult couple of years because there were lots of inquiries that we had to, to field. There were lots of, uh, of things that we had to investigate, lots of, uh, of all these things that go with this, this whole, where, what is God doing? And this waiting and this wondering what God's plan might be and then also battling within us our own will and our own wants. And so I took these two verses and I wrote them on a sticky note because I love sticky notes and I put them in my office and I looked at it every day, and I prayed these verses regularly. And finally, through a series of God-ordained events, the answer, which we really were not expecting, became clear. Waiting 
isn't easy. We know that. In fact, not one of us really likes to wait. But waiting for the Lord, that's an essential posture of faith. Knowing that our firm and faithful God, the one who is forever, he will deliver. And just like David, we don't know how and we don't know when, but we know that he will. He will always do what's best for his children and he will never, ever forsake one who is his. This is our confidence as God's people in Jesus. This is what gives us such a great hope. And it's not a cross our fingers, kind of wishful thinking kind of hope. No, this hope is real. This hope is sure. And this hope is certain. Let's pray together. Father in heaven, we thank you for the opportunity to, to look into your word today. And to continue thinking about and reflecting upon this, this great, huge, magnificent, biblical topic of hope. And we thank you for Psalm 27. We thank you for what you inspired David to write so that we get a sense of, of what was going on for David. And we can identify with that very clearly when we feel like things are spinning out of control and yet just as David, fear does not have to rule us. We can have that same confidence. Because by grace through faith in Jesus, David's God is our God. And our God is firm. He is the stronghold of our lives. He is our refuge. He is our shelter in the day of trouble. And our God is faithful. He is relentlessly steadfast. And he will never forsake his children. And that as much as God is firm and faithful, he is forever. He will never change. This is our confidence. And this is a confidence that fills us with hope. God, some of us desperately need to hear that today. We need to hear this message right now with things that are going on around us, with things that are happening within us, we need this message. We need this truth. Father, for each and every one of us, as we live in a, in a world, as we have lives that can change so quickly, we all need this truth. And to be reminded that you are firm and you are faithful and that you forever will be. That you will Hold us fast. In Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. Friends, would you rise if you're able? Saves are his delight. 
Christ will hold me fast, precious in his holy sight. He will hold me fast, he'll not let my soul be lost. His promises shall last, brought by him at such a cost. Before we close together, we receive God's parting blessing. Receive that blessing now. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord turn his face towards you and grant you his peace now and always. Amen.